Hello everyone, and welcome to another game lecture. I am uh, Jason Bullman, I'm the uh, director of game design at Paizo. I created the Pathfinder role-playing game, I lead the team that makes all of your stuff for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And today what I want to talk to you about is how to make an exciting player character. I've, I've done some videos over the past couple weeks talking about how uh, you can run a quick one-shot, how you can run games for uh, one or two players. All that's been some GM-focused advice. I figured it was probably time for us to talk about player characters and how to build an exciting player character. Obviously, there's a million different ways you can go about this. This is the method that I like to use. Um, you may have your own. There are plenty others out there. All the advice I'm giving here is, is applicable no matter what type or what strategy you're going to apply. And if you decide to go with a different strategy, strategy, that's just as valid. It's up to you. But this is how I like to approach building a character to make sure that I'm an exciting, uh, adaptable part of the play experience for not just myself, but for everybody else at the table and for the GM. So let's get this started. So the first thing I'm going to do here is um, I'd like to sit, start by uh, talking about what I think is the critical kind of first step, and that is the seed. What that? What's the tiny little nugget? The the the, the first thought of a character, and and I like to call it the seed. What's the where's where's the germination point for this character? And there's there's a lot of different ways you can approach this. There are um, a, a whole bunch of different vectors you can approach to to start out uh, with the seed. So. Um, one of the first things you can do, the most obvious thing, and I think this is the most common seed for most people, is just what I like to call the basics. And that is, what is your ancestry background class? Or if you're playing first edition, what's your what's your race and your class, right? You know, so saying, oh, I want to be a, a dwarf fighter or an elf wizard or a gnome uh, rogue, right? I, I, that's, that's kind of the most basic way to approach building a character. Nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly valid way to start framing the character in your mind um, gives you kind of the most important details of character creation uh, with second edition i like to add background in there too because i think it speaks a lot to where your mindset is on the character that was one of the big reasons we added background to the game um, so to give you kind of more than just who are your parents and what are you as an adventurer asking how did you grow up what was the circumstances of your youth is an important question so that's kind of the basics. That's You can go with that as your seed, the basics. Another seed you might want to consider is something, uh, you know, the story. Um, you're imagining a character that comes from a very specific past. This is kind of an outbranch of background. So instead of picking ancestry and cl uh, class, start with the background. Maybe that's the part that you really want to start with as kind of the key impetus for your character. So what you're doing is you're starting out with just like some facet of a character story. Oh, I want to play an orphan who doesn't know who their parents are. Great. That, that's that's a story uh, seed. Um, oh, I want to play someone from the other side of the world who's traveling the world and is lost and looking for a way home. That's, that's a story seed. Um... Another uh, seed that I like to consider, um, you know, if I'm not going with basics, I'm not going with story, um, a seed that I like to call the hook. Um, and what this is, is that there's something in the game or the game world that I want to explore. And, and, and that's the hook that I'm going to hang my character off of. So let's say I want to build a character. You know what? I've never played a, a shield fighting character, a character that, that their entire thing is bashing and beating people up with a shield. This could be a very rule-specific thing, and, and that's a perfectly valid place to start your character. Starting with just some facet of the rules that you find interesting that you want to play around with, nothing wrong with that at all. That's a good way to start building your character. That doesn't have to be rules-focused, though. That could be world-focused as well. Oh, there's this weird um, wizard order in the game world that I really want my character to be a reject from. That's a perfectly reasonable hook seed. Um, another one that I think is pretty popular that I see in a lot of groups is you have someone who is... Uh, I, this seed I like to call the cog. And what it is is the everyone else has kind of picked what they want to be and you are deciding your character based on what they are all playing 
So you kind of wait for the rest of the group to gel a bit and build a character that complements the rest of the group. And and that's that's the impetus of the character is how do I build a character that complements what everyone else is playing or rounds out the group. You're you're a cog in the machine of the, of the players and you really want to make sure you fill that role. Um another seed that I think is pretty valid is um the quirk um, it's just a character that's strange or weird. There's something just odd that you want to explore. Th this one's very system specific, I think. Um, uh, but like, if you if you want to play counter to expectations, so you, this is the type of character that is like, oh, I'm playing a wizard, but I'm a wizard who uses all my spells to make myself better at wrestling. That's the character I want to play. This is very similar to some of the other ones, and in fact is kind of a modifier on the other ones, but it kind of can stand on its own, depending on how you want to approach it. So, like, a court character is... Oh, I want to play a character who never speaks. Can speak, but has taken a vow of silence. And that's a weird and interesting quirk. They don't always have to be rules-based. They could just be the way you want to play them. But you want to, you're trying to play a character that m plays counter to what the game kind of expects. Uh, I find that most groups never work with more than one of these. If you've got a whole group of these, everything kind of is like, what is even normal? What is even, what is even, what is even the, the group trying to accomplish? The last character seed I think that's worth talking about is uh, called the Anchor. This is, this is a character seed that I like to play a lot personally. And the Anchor, the way to build an Anchor character is to talk to the GM about what the story is about try and figure out what the setup of it is and build a character that is intrinsically tied to the tale. You are a, your character is a pivotal component of the story you're about to play. So you're basically building to the story. So if the story is about, uh, you know, uh, the king's, uh, you know, prince, his son uh, going off and running away from home, uh, and uh, the, the, the impetus of the story is you are hired, your group is hired to go find him. Your, the anchor character could be, oh, this is the captain of the guard who's being sent along to make sure the, the quest goes off without a hitch. Right? Um, so that is, uh, you know, one uh, very good possibility. Uh, somebody in chat said that uh, the Avengers are the heroes the GM expects, but the mystery men are the heroes the GMs actually gets. That's very true. Um, that is that that's like court characters in a nutshell. Uh, going back to that seed is like, oh, you're what I expect you are. Oh wait, no, you're not. You're not at all. I don't even know what you are. Um, works really well um, with like one or two of the groups. You can do a group that's all court characters, but I think it's actually really tricky. So. Those are those are kind of very classic seeds. There are others that are probably less common than that, but I think I think those uh, among those uh, I think the basics being the I have an ancestry background in class are that is a super common seed. Uh, I think that's the one that most people start with of just kind of like I know I want to play a, a you know a goblin rogue. That's it. That's that's the that's the seed of the character. I think the last step of, once you've got your seed, is rounding it out into a full concept. Evaluating the other things, like, in that list of seeds that are that are facets of a character that you aren't really considering just yet. Okay, I want to play a goblin rogue. Well, what else do I want to know about this goblin rogue? Is he hooked into the story? Is he... Does this character have an interesting quirk? Is there... Yeah, there's more to it, right? You can, you can look at the character from different angles and start to turn from a seed into more of a character concept and slowly from that first germination you start building in okay i kind of want to maybe uh, i'll start picking the weapons maybe i'll start thinking about how i interact with other players maybe i'll start thinking about how i interact with the story where i'm from you're, you're taking that first decision and using it to help inform the other decisions you make and that's what makes it the seed, because it's the first thing you considered. It isn't the thing that sprung later. All right. So, to recap. <laughs> Part one. 
uh, is the seed of your character. And you start by determining what that seed is. Uh, you can go with the basics, kind of ancestry, background, class. You can start with a uh, story, uh, what was uh, vital to the character's background. Uh, you can start by building, uh, by choosing a hook, something in the story that you want to explore or play with, something in the game you want to explore or play with. You could start by being a cog, filling out the rest of the game group, what, what's missing from the party. You can start by picking a weird quirk or something very particular that you want to build from. Or you can start by being the anchor, talking to the GM and finding a way to make yourself an integral component um, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the GM's story. And then uh, you go to round out that seed. All right. Let's move on to the second step. Building your character. I, I know this is all about building a good PC, but this is the actual part where you sit down and start determining uh, what your character is going to be. And uh, for this, um, uh, there's the first thing that I think is most important for everyone to do is you're going to want to sit down and talk to the group. Figure out what they're playing. Uh, figure out what everyone else at the table is contemplating uh, rolling with. This is often time in most groups. This is the session zero where everybody kind of sits down and talks about their characters, what they expect, what they don't expect. And um, uh, what you're going to want to do is look for opportunities to have a niche within that group. And you're going to want to look for pitfalls based on your character concept. So, like, um, you know, if I'm going to be playing the rogue who sneaks around and steals all the time and rides that line of like, is this guy actually a good guy or is this a, a, a thief who just happens to travel with other adventurers? That, that can be a real problem if you're playing in a group that's like, oh no, we have a lawful good cleric and a champion and we are following the law and we're going to sign up for the army and your character doesn't want to be a part of that. There are opportunities there and there's pitfalls. Um, and understanding that that's what... Um, you're going to have to really think about um, uh, when you're playing is really important because, right, this is a game. And it's a game with a bunch of other people at the table and they are there to have a good time too. And the entire point of your character can't be so in conflict with everyone else's characters and expectations that in essence you're spoiling the fun for them. That That's not to say you don't get to make your own choices and build your own character, but it's all about understanding that gaming is a give and take and that um, you're all there to tell a story together and that's only really going to work if everybody's kind of marching to the same beat to some extent. I mean, um, yeah, somebody in chat uh, calls it the social contract. That's exactly true, right? Gaming involves a social contract and that social contract um, is, you know, we're all going to sit here and cooperatively tell a story, so my character has to be a cogent part of that story. I can't be the discordant part that somebody goes, well, who wrote that character? So that's the first thing you want to do. But that's also a good chance for you to look for opportunities to stand out and be um, exciting and be uh, kind of the star of the show at moments. That's really important. Right. Uh, if someone else is kind of, oh, I really want to play the archer character. Well, the group can have two archer characters and maybe it'll be interesting if the two of you are kind of at odds with each other competing over who is the best archer character. But if that's not super integral to your character, then trying to move into that territory just generally means that you aren't going to be able to shine as much as them. That's what they're building toward. Um, so that's going to cause you to have few opportunities to really stand out. So uh, at the end of step one, I talked about rounding out your seed and, and kind of building it into a concept. In step two, that's where you're going to take that concept and really start expanding it out and adjusting it based on what the other players have said and use it to start making decisions about your character. You're going to want to start picking whatever the game system allows you to pick. You know, for Pathfinder, that's going to be ancestry, background, and class. It's going to be feats. It's going to be spells. It's going to be gear. You're going to expand out your concept. And as you do so, um, this is a perfect time to talk about how you should start 
expanding into your niche. You've talked to what, about what the other players are good at. You should have an idea at this point in time about what things your character is going to bring to the group that other players don't. And you're going to want to maximize your choices to be a very effective member of the party in those areas. Arguably, you you should be willing to sacrifice competencies in non-core areas to make your core area as strong as possible. And this, I understand the natural drive to uh, ensure that your character doesn't have any weaknesses or pitfalls. Let me just stop you right there. Playing a character with flaws is way more fun than playing a character with none. So when you're building your choices, when you're making um, your options, you do kind of min-max, but part of min-maxing is understanding that you have some mins. <laughs> um, you are going to want to build into your competencies, have good adjacent skills that are important for your character to be well-rounded, but understand that you have weaknesses and don't try and patch them, at least not at first. Um, if they if they really prove too much of a problem, it's something to look at. But I honestly think characters are more exciting when they have things that they're not good at, when they're not skilled at them. Pathfinder 2nd Edition is really good at, at making it so that you can easily build a character that's good at the things it's supposed to be good at, but not good at the things that aren't really important to that character. And that's okay. Um... That's why you have other characters. They fill those strengths. You want them to. You want to give them the option to. Your character doesn't need to be good at everything. Let them be good at those things. So, as you're building out your character, one of the things that I like to do uh, during the process is stop and think about the character's average day. Think about how they go through their day from beginning to end um, and what kind of flourishes and choices you can make during character creation that are going to exemplify how that works. So, um, you know, think about how your character wakes up, how they prepare for the day, how they eat. What do they eat? How do they explore places? How do they enter combat? How do they exit combat? How do they recover uh, from wounds and how do they rest how do they how do they buckle down for the night picking your gear picking your feet picking your equipment picking um, you know all of your choices can speak to that and make a more well-rounded character it's little things like that oh my character never leaves without a bar of rosemary soap why it's just what he likes to smell like and little details like that are really going to help round out your character. Um, so that's really important. I always, I always try and imagine how my character goes through the day from start to end. Now, with Pathfinder 2nd Edition, there's also something that's always worth considering. Most of the things that you pick are about uh, what your character does while they're out adventuring, but we have downtime as well in the game. It's always good to think about what your character does during downtime. If your character can't go out and adventure for a while because of a bad wound or because of bad weather, what do they do to earn money? It doesn't have to be anything super concrete, but look at your skills, figure out something. If you, if you find yourself with a skill choice that you're like, oh, I can train in something, but I don't know what it is. Pick something to uh, do in downtime. Pick something that uh, you can uh, utilize when everyone else is back in town, resting, recuperating, making magic items that you can use to make some money. Buy equipment and gear that speaks to that. Do the things that make your character more than just a cardboard cutout of a combat machine, right? Give them skills that apply outside of combat. Give them quirks that speak to what they do when you know the group's quiet you know oh i'm playing a fighter i don't i don't have to prepare anything in the morning so what do i do while everyone else prepares oh i practice my forms like i stand off to the side and swing my sword around and get myself limber for the day and i also you know that's also when i sharpen all my blades so you know obviously i better make sure i have a whetstone and i've got this manual of fighting techniques 
that was given to me by my father. That's a very interesting little character tidbit. Doesn't really have to matter one whit towards the rules, but it does make things interesting. It makes your character more real. <laughs> yeah, you mean role play? Someone asked. Yeah, I mean role play. Not R O L L. <laughs> All right. So that's kind of step two. Let's uh, let's sum that up. So uh, for step two, what you're going to want to do is uh, you're going to want to talk to the group, figure out what they're playing. You're going to want to adjust your concept uh, and expand it based on what they're playing, what they're leaving on the table, what they're trying to focus on. Make sure that you have your own niche. You're going to want to build into that niche. Make it so that your character is optimal and good at what you want your character to be good at. Unless it's part of your story that they're not good at the thing that you say that they're good at. But even then, you should figure out the thing that they actually are good at. Right? That can be interesting in and of itself for a story hook. Um, you want to leave yourself some vulnerabilities. Don't try and patch over or paper over everything your character isn't good at. It's okay to be bad at things. To find your character. Um, work out your character's routine. How do they wake up? How do they prepare? How do they explore? How do they rest? All those sorts of things. Answer those questions. Have a, have a picture in your head of what that character does throughout the adventuring day. Uh, figure out what your character does uh, in downtime. What do they do when they're back in town? How do they live? Do they have a home? Do they have a job? Do they have, do they have uh, you know, hobbies? What do they do? Do they earn money doing this? Maybe, maybe use that to inform your skill decisions. And finally, uh, uh, quirks. What other weird quirks does your character have? Uh, you know, oftentimes you're left with places where you can make other decisions as well about your character. And little things about speech affectations or the way they handle themselves or maybe they, they, they offer up a prayer at the end of every battle um, over the foes of their slain enemies that has something to do with their childhood. There's so many different things that you can add to a character, most of which have nothing to do with what feats you choose, what gear you pick, what spells you decide to prepare, but they make your character into an actual, real, interesting individual and less uh, an assemblage of statistics and choices. We, you know, I'm Pathfinder is a game that gives you a lot of choices about your character, and you might think that is where the decision-making ends, but it's not. You can take it a lot further than that. You can go and really figure out what makes your character tick. All right. Time to get to that final step. Step three. Connect. So the last thing you want to do when you're building a character, kind of the, the last step, you've, you've talked to, you've come up with a seed, you've talked to the group, you've chosen your feats, your skills, your things like that. The, the, the next thing you want to do is connect to the story and the game. And of all the steps, this one is particularly important. It's not to say the others aren't important, but this one, this is the one that's going to determine whether or not you have a good time with this character long term. Uh, so the first thing I like to do is figure out a basic personality for my character. Um, how do I think this character is going to respond? How do I think they act in certain situations? Think about some moral problems, some moral challenges. How would they respond? Figure out kind of, do they have any speech quirks? Do they have any ways of talking? Do they have any aphorisms that they like to uh, uh, swear before combat or whenever they're hurt? Start building that character profile. But I want to stress one thing that's super important right now. Don't get locked on any of these. Figure out what they are. Figure out what you imagine you're going to use. But don't be so convinced that this is going to be the end-all, be-all of your character. I can't tell you how many times I've started playing a character only two sessions in to realize some of the decisions I made during character creation don't work or aren't quite what I want them to be. This is the key. You need to be willing to understand that the way that you actually play the character at the table may not 100% uh, align with the choices you made when you were building the character. 
In a lot of groups that I've been in, there's been a certain amount of fungibility in, like, first level to be like, yeah, at the end of first level, you can lock down any choices. Uh, as a GM, I highly recommend giving your players that level of flexibility. Let them play through first level. They can't change anything while they're playing first level, but at the end, before they go to second, if they want to make changes about their character, that's the time to do it. Because once you're beyond first, everything's locked in. But if they, like, oh, I really wanted to play a character that whittled the whole bunch... And then they were playing, and they were just like, oh god, that's lame. But they did realize that their character had a had a, a jug, and they started playing the jug at night. You know, just, just, just blowing on the jug. Great. If that's what they want to do, let them change out a skill, and fine. Whatever. It doesn't really matter, but it's more interesting for them. Don't shackle yourself to the personality choices you made before you ever played the character. Because you will often find that the interactions you have with the other player characters, with the NPCs, with the other people in your group, are a little different. And if the character doesn't meet your expectations, give yourself that flexibility to decide to go a different way. Don't lock yourself to something you wrote down before you even started playing. Next up, and um, this is super critical, is... Uh, Investigate this: how the story is beginning. How what's the start of the adventure that you're about to begin? Figure out what your character's hook is into that story. Um, most of the time during session zero, the GM will talk to everybody about what the start of the adventure is. Um, basically, kind of like what, how does this whole thing begin, and why does my character care about that? That's on you as a player. The GM is there to provide you hooks that you can grab, but it's on you as the player to find a reason for your character to like that hook and to roll with it. Fundamentally, the, the, the GM can't force you to go on a quest, but because this is a group game and you can't narrate what all of your characters are doing, you have to grab one of those hooks and say, yes, this one works for my character. That's on you. Uh, I have played in games before. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I have played in games where I have played the character who was like, "Yeah, I'm not going on that quest." And instead, what happened is the rest of the players went on the quest, and I was left sitting in town. I was so proud of my character decision, and it led to a four-hour session of me doing nothing at all. In fact, when it got to combat, the the game would go around the table, and it would come to me and it'd be like. I continue to sip my ale because I'm back in the bar and not down in the sewers where my character wouldn't go because he was a dandy and didn't like going down in the sewers. So, like, you can play that character, but understand it's to the detriment of your fun and the fun of everyone else at the table. So it's best to find a reason to go along with the hooks that are presented. Even if it isn't perfectly in character, this is one of those areas that uh, uh, you really should grab something and move along. Next up, you figured out how you're uh, working into the story. Uh, I think it's important to think of a goal for your character. What does your character want to accomplish? This is something you're going to want to share with the GM. Maybe not with the other players. They don't need to know necessarily. But you're going to want to share your character's goal with the Game Master. Uh, so, you know, let's say you had a character, you know, this character from the other side of the world who desperately wanted to find a way home. That's your goal. It's it's part of your character's hook. Uh, it's part of your character's story seed. That's fine. Um, you know, maybe instead it's just, oh, I want my character to be something unattainable. I want to be the best swordsman in the world. That's not an attainable goal necessarily, but it is something to strive for. It at least gives the GM ideas about what to put in the story to make your journey through it um, engaging. Um, you know, uh, and, and oftentimes uh, this can be related to why you are being an adventurer to begin with. Um, this can be a reason as to why you aren't, you know, just being a farmer, as someone from chat just recommended. Um, so, you know, that's an important thing to have. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you out being an adventurer? What is your goal? What's your what's your purpose for for going out into the wide, wide world and fighting dragons? Because as it turns out, that's a very not safe way to live. Um, 
you know, the one thing I think we take for granted is that, oh, we're all playing heroes and this is just what heroes do. No, it's highly deadly. <laughs> People go out there all the time and they don't come back. So why are you doing it? What, what makes you uh, willing to take the risk? Now, this next one is kind of optional, but I, I, I tend to do it uh, all the time. And this is to talk about uh, with your GM. This is part of the discussion with the GM about any uh, mysteries or flaws or problems that your character might have. So something from your past that you just don't know about, that you're willing to give to the GM. I, This is like laying out uh, a trail of breadcrumbs for the GM. You don't know where that trail goes. You're leaving that to the GM to decide. But you might want to lay it out for them and say, Hey, I have a rival from when I was a kid. This is what the character was then. This was important to me. Um, and uh, I left this character for dead in a dungeon 15 years ago. I've never seen him since. You do something with it. Um, I like talking to my, uh, my GM to give them tools to make my character a better part of the story. Goals are one facet of that. But you can play with all the other facets too. Are there mysteries? Are there flaws? Does your character have... Is your, is your family, your character's family suffering under a lifelong curse? It hasn't hit you yet, but you have no idea when it might. Right? I think all that is very fun and interesting. Talking to your GM about how to weave your character into the story is ultimately going to mean that this story is much more about you. Now, if everyone else does this as well, the story becomes about the player characters, which is what you ultimately want. I think some of the... And this isn't to knock on this sort of experience, but I think very frequently when you're running, say, a pre-published module, it's just a module, and there are characters that are going on this adventure, and the, the, the story becomes theirs because of the adventure that they have in it but it's not theirs by virtue of it being about them if that makes sense right if i'm going to go fight a bunch of fire giants in their hall um that that's that's a story that any adventurer can go on now it becomes my story because it's my tale of how i defeated it but it's not fundamentally about my character it could be through some of the steps i've outlined above it could turn into that Right? If, uh, if that fire giant uh, killed my parents and that's why I'm on this adventure, well, all of a sudden that's a lot more interesting. Um, but you can do that with any story, right? And, and the GM can weave your plot line into the story. I think some of the most rewarding times I've had is when the player characters have given me grist for the mill. A uh, little secret about uh, Knights of Everflame is that I had... No idea who uh, killed uh, Iculus's parents. I only built that based... Uh, that whole storyline came upon about because of what Jeremy wanted to do with his character. I didn't design that. That was something that came about naturally. As a matter of fact, during the first season, determining who the villain was at the very end there, that surprise, happened at the table. That wasn't something I planned out in advance. And it was because of the tale he had woven about his his character and his family and his backstory. So, uh, lastly, and, uh, uh, and, yeah, P. Fred is absolutely right. Achilles' mother is still alive. It's just his father who's dead. Yeah. Um, so, lastly, um, the kind of last step in building uh, kind of a PC for me. Now that I've I've figured out my seed, I've rounded it out, I've talked to the group, I've built the character, I've worked out his backstory, I've hooked it into the tale, I have an idea of where I want the character to go. Uh, it's good to imagine what kind of arc the character might have. This is kind of my my last tip, and and fundamentally this is one of the hardest ones, which is why I kind of save it for the end because it's it's good to have all the other pieces in place before you start thinking about what this could possibly be. But it's good to start imagining what kind of arc you imagine this character having. I played a character once who started out as kind of a 
a bastard. He started out as a, not a very good character. In the early days of the campaign, he was he he ran away from home. He was arrogant. He was the son of nobles. He he was used to getting his own way. He treated other people like trash. And the arc I imagined for that character was him coming to realize that he couldn't do it by himself, that he wasn't powerful enough to accomplish all the things that he wanted to do. He was a sorcerer, and he, he this is in James Jacobs' office campaign, and, and he wanted to be powerful. He wanted to go back and show his parents what he had become because they kicked him out. And the arc I imagined was him building up power to go do that, but in the process, realizing that he couldn't do it alone. That he was, um, that despite all of his powers, he still didn't have everything. That his, that power didn't solve his problems, didn't solve his feelings of inadequacy. And that through the player characters, he might learn some semblance of humility and start to learn that his ways were not, um, exactly the right ones so the arc was one of redemption from him from being selfish to being selfless and right at the end of the campaign my character gave his own life or at least everybody thought he did high level sorcerer simulacrum's a thing but it was fun that was really interesting actually i think it was clone now that i think about it um so but imagining your character's arc, where do, they, where do they start and where do they end up? Assuming your character comes from humble beginnings, what happens to them when they get power and prestige? Imagine what that looks like. You want to have an idea of where you're going. That way, as you go there, you can make the subtle changes in your character because the rules are going to start giving you the tools to be playing that different character as you go along, especially in a game like Pathfinder. Um, where over time you grow in power, you grow in, grow in prestige, you grow in wealth. Imagine what that would do to your character. Imagine how that would transform them. Maybe, instead what you want to imagine is, oh, what, what happens when my character finally meets their goal? They, they have this goal that I have in mind. They're not going to meet that goal at 20th level. They're going to meet that at like 8th. Do they retire? Maybe. Maybe that's the satisfying story you're trying to tell. And it all starts from imagining the arc of your character and deciding how you you might try and get there. But the only way to figure that out is to, is to know where you want to go at the beginning. But just like everything else, you got to be flexible in that because the story may not play out that way. And maybe what your character witnesses is far more terrifying and horrible and the idea of retiring and just owning a tavern no longer makes sense for your character. That's okay too. The The story and your experiences can transform where your arc takes you. But it always helps to have some idea of where it might go, all things being equal. If that makes sense. Alright, so to wrap up. Part 3 is connecting to the story. Figure out your basic personality, but stay flexible. Understand that as you play the character, the, some of the things that you want to do may work, may not work. Uh, be prepared to adjust, especially in those first couple sessions. Next up, build your story hook. Uh, how does your character fit into the story and make it strong? If uh, the GM presents the, the idea for the adventure and you're like, yeah, not for me, eh, you've probably just messed up. That's not the way to go. You want to make sure that your character has a vested reason to participate in the story. Set out some goals. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what do you want your player to accomplish? What do you want them to, uh, ultimately try and do? Uh, why are they out there being an adventurer, right? Uh, but give the GM tools to make your life interesting. <laughs> I was going to say miserable, but interesting is perhaps the better, the better way to go. Um, you know, what, what about, um, uh, your... Uh, backstory, what about your history uh, is the GM going to be able to play with to make the story more about you and your character? How is your how is, how is your character actually a part of this story and not just someone who is also there? And lastly, imagine your arc. Where do you see this character going? How do you see this character progressing and growing? I think one of the most critical parts about running a, uh, a tabletop role-playing game is that the characters that you are playing grow and change over time. 
you don't start as uh, you know a powerful world guiding warlord I mean depending on the game you might but in most cases you start out as someone from pretty humble beginnings and how do you get to the heights of power you should figure that out that is what makes this whole thing fun and interesting all right everybody I've been talking for about 45 minutes now and fumbling around with my spelling. So, uh, why don't we open it up for some questions. And let me go and bring the chat back. Let it turn here too. All right. There we are. Okay. All right. So, if folks have questions, we're going to open it up for questions for about uh, 20 minutes here. And uh, we will see how it goes. So, if you have questions about building your characters, why don't you uh, feel free to throw those in chat. Uh, and uh, and we can certainly talk about them. I see that folks have been uh, chatting quite a bit. So, what advice do I have for both uh, the GM and player side for working personal hooks and such into the adventure paths? Um, I think the key here is understanding the scope of your hook. So... Um, when you're running a published adventure, the published adventure has a lot less flexibility in some cases than uh, your homebrew, where you know the gym can kind of modify things on the fly or f stall out certain plot lines to make things take longer. I think that when you're working with a published adventure, one of the things you're going to want to do is make sure that your hook, your story piece, is the right scope for the story you're trying to tell. If the story that you're trying to tell is one of traveling over the, you know, across the world and you really want to have this interesting family drama, recognizing that that's the wrong scope for the story you're trying to tell is important. You might want to consider something that's a little bit more approachable by the GM and the story that's trying to be told. This is something the GM might know more than the player, so this is one of those things where you need to have an open and frank conversation about whether or not a character backstory actually works. I think that is always a challenge as GM. I'm guilty of this in the past, where players have decided their character story, and I'm like, well, it's your character, and full well knowing in the back of my head that they're not going to be participating in the story with that chunk of their character backstory because it just doesn't fit. So understanding that sometimes those things, you might have to go back to the player and be like, hey, listen, I know you were really excited about that, but that's not actually going to be able to be a part of the current narrative. I'm not saying you have to jettison it, but you might want to think of something else to add on to. Uh, how should alignment affect personality? I'm of two minds on this. Um, I think there's two ways that you can approach alignment. Uh, one is uh, kind of what I would call the standard way and the way that I think most GMs approach it. Uh, the other is a way that I as GM tend to approach alignment, uh, given the opportunity. Um, so I'll start with the first way. The first way is you pick your alignment and you play the character to that alignment. I, th I think that's what it says in the book, right? Um, so if I decide, oh, I'm going to play someone who's chaotic good, I'm picking that because I already know that the character decisions that I'm going to make uh, while I'm playing that character model chaotic good relatively well. The other way, though, and I think this works a little better in most games, is you don't pick alignment right away. Um, once again, wait until the end of first level to pick your alignment. Now, obviously, there are some characters for whom their alignment is is set or, or regulated by the game rules. That's fine. Um, for them, they have fewer choices. Um, but for everyone else, I almost recommend just waiting to pick your alignment. Play the character a bit. I, I think if you got a lot of experience, um, you know, it might be the sort of thing where you, you can you can do that on the fly. I know I certainly can. If I'm if I'm handed a lawful neutral character, I can play that character instantaneously. But if it's a character of my own design and I, I wanna kind of explore what the character is, um, you know, give yourself a little little leeway. Uh, let's see. Catacordon, do you prefer to have the character personality decided on before the adventure, or do you let it grow organically? I like to have seeds and ideas about what the character's personality is before I start playing. I think everybody should. But I also think that's not required. And I also think giving yourself the leeway to have the character's personality grow and expand and change through play is really important. Especially in those first couple sessions. Because I don't think it's really very possible to have the character's voice and build down until you actually crawl into their skin and play them a bit. I think that's kind of impossible. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Vampire as a forever GM. I took away two major points relevant to me. One is the fact that it's on the player to buy into the adventure. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to bribe them into joining the story. You, as GM, though, I do want to stress you do have to provide the the players plots and hooks, right? But I think it's up to the players to come up with a reason why their characters on this adventure. I don't think you have to find something that's personally engaging to them. Very oftentimes, there are players who will just be like, no, <laughs> and it's it, that's no good. Um, they have to come along for the ride. Um, th this is the story you've decided to tell, and everybody else is is getting getting into it and getting motivated. Now, you can do yourself as a favor as a GM and say, hey, here's the hook that everyone needs to interact with. You get your choice of how you do it, but, right, so uh, at the start of Fall of Plaguestone, the hook I give everyone is you have to come up with a reason as to why you're in the back of a wagon traveling from Isgur to Andoran. That's it. I don't care what your reason is, but that's the main hook I need you to interact with. You're in that wagon. Do you know the other players? I don't care. You can if you want. You don't have to, but you're in this wagon. I started a different campaign. There is this old scholar in town. This was an old home game I did, um, which is there's an old scholar in town. All of you must have a personal connection to this character, and you must think of them fondly or favorably. That's it. How? Up to you. Um, yeah, the Skyrim method. You are a prisoner in the back of a wagon. Yeah, about to get your head cut off. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, we've all been there multiple times. Um, yeah, and uh, to finish out Vampire's comment from earlier, yeah, you don't have to be perfect and good at everything. As a matter of fact, it's way more fun if you're not. <laughs> the game is far more interesting if there are things your character is bad at. Um, like, that's just... That's just my personal favorite trick of making a character that's fun and memorable. Playing a character who is clumsy and stumbles around and can't jump over things and is physically... You know, it's like, you want to play that wizard who is actually, like, frail? Yeah, tank your strength. <laughs> Be bad at strength and dex. Yeah, stumble around the dungeon, fail your reflex saves. That's yeah, tons of fun. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can go so far that your character gets killed really easily, and that is, of course, a challenge. But, you know, that's, you know, still fun to play. Let your your weaknesses give other characters a chance to shine, which is also an important responsibility of being a player. Well, I mean, don't have a con penalty. I mean, <laughs> unless you don't want to play the character very much. Don't, don't, don't start with a con penalty. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Most quirky character I have ever played. So, uh, back in the old RPG A days, they, they used to run a lot of modules um, that were called classics. And in those games, you got handed a character and got to play a, a character that was designed by the author. This had some upsides and some downsides. The upsides are is there is, eh, you know, about a third of those modules were really written, written with the characters in mind. Uh, and then, uh, you know, um, the rest were just kind of here some random characters with interesting personalities. Now, sometimes that meant that you were playing some really weird characters. Um, there was one adventure where everyone, uh, this, this a classic, I think it was, where everyone was playing an intelligent magic item and you were trying to control the same adventurer. That's it. You were all a piece of gear on one character. It was hilarious. Um, there was another adventure I played where um, I you it was all one giant family going off on an adventure, and I think I was the pregnant mom. It was ridiculous, and uh, you know a, a lot of fun to see everybody crawl around inside these characters that we had no control over. Right, you know they they just got handed to us and we got to play them. So I mean you know over the years I've played a lot of different kinds of characters and and this is a good way to step out of your own experiences and imagine what some of these other lives and other worlds are like. Don't be afraid to embrace that. Um. Yeah, Irish said that he allows uh, characters to swap out between the APs. Yeah, I mean that that's another thing like that a lot of us don't ever consider that sometimes your character's story ends and you're not dead and that's okay 
I had a character that in the middle of a campaign just retired. Was just like, I've seen enough. I did what this character was here to do. And I probably should just, you know, retire. I, I want to go back to my ordinary farm life. And just left. That's okay. Gave me an opportunity to make a new interesting character that made more sense for the story at that point. So, uh, Kaffa asked about my, my character, my noble character who wouldn't go down in the sewers. How did I, how, how would I have done that situation differently? Well, nowadays I would definitely play that differently. In, in the heat of the moment, the players had decided, the rest of the group had decided to chase a bad guy down into the sewers. I didn't want to do it. Uh, because my character was in finery, like I, I had noble wear on, and my character was like, oh no. I'm not going on that adventure. And at the time I was like, oh, I'm sure it's just a little romp in the sewer, but it was actually an entire dungeon. And I just didn't go. <laughs> so what would I have done differently? Well, I would have went and complained about it the entire time and demanded that I could go buy peasant clothing, clothing first. That's the way to be interesting. I could still go on the adventure. I can still play my character accurately Instead, I'm just being kind of a pain, <laughs> like, and complaining about the smell and really hamming it up to add texture to the other, to the other players, right? You know, some of them might just be like, well, sewers, same as a dungeon, whatever. And I'm like, oh my God, it stinks down here. And I think some of it got inside of my boot. I can feel it squishing between my toes, right? You know, stuff like that would have made it kind of interesting and fun uh, to play around with. Don't all Pathfinder APs go into the sewer? Um, a lot of them do. <laughs> sewer is a common adventuring location. Uh, let's see. And her, my current uh, strength 7 and no kind of skill and anything charisma based. Great for knowledge of the crafting, but don't ask him to diplomatize. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, that gets back to um having characters that are good at one thing but bad at other things because it is always fun and exciting when those characters end up out of their element desperately trying to be an okay component of the story because they're not always and uh you know that's going to be a, a real challenge for them but that's fun right i mean it is just as fun to be kind of bad at a thing and roll with it and be graceful in failure uh, as it is to be awesome at a thing, right? So, does anyone got any more questions? More questions. This hour has really flown by. I was kind of surprised at how quickly this went by. We are uh, wrapping up our uh, stream here in, in just a few minutes. So if anybody has any last minute questions, I will take them now. I can hear you all typing. <laughs> Have you ever tried to get a player excited to play a role that was missing? So that's interesting. That's more from the GM side of things. Um, how do you get a player like, I, I think it's up to the group to decide whether or not they're missing a role. It's up to the GM to adjust to what they are and are not good at, right? So if the group decides to play, you know, no one in the group wants to play the healer, then, you know, they've decided not to play the healer. Now, fortunately, in some games, this is less of a problem than in others, but like Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you can certainly make do without having a healer but it can be a big challenge. So, you know, you as GM have to adjust to that and not force them into a role they don't want to play. Now, there are points in time where you're trying to run a story where you desperately need one type of character in the story for the story to work. Um, for that, you you really just have to have to work with them to make sure somebody covers it. And, and you know, if the character you're talking to doesn't want to, then talk to somebody else. Um... Let's see. Apple knees. What is my opinion about allowing for semi-large or major character changes later in the levels? Would you recommend them starting an entirely new character or somehow work that all out in the story? Well, one of the great things about uh, Pathfinder in general is that downtime is kind of a thing. It wasn't first edition. It is now. And retraining has always been a part of the game. Or at least since, you know, Ultimate Campaign. Um, 
so uh you know i i i'm is as long as it's not an entire recasting of the character like if they're just changing out some feats or maybe changing out a few levels to be something else that's fine right i mean you can always talk about how they're learning new skills and stuff i generally as gm like to talk to my players about that uh uh like a level before they actually make all the changes so we can start working it into the story to make it less of a um sudden change and more of a gradual thing even one level is generally enough to make that happen uh vampire question what if you have been gm so long that you forgot how to pc then you have no inspiration for new characters and never know where to start asking for a friend i have a sneaking suspicion vampire that that friend is you um so uh how do you like restart your character generation mind um it's not too hard um I, I i think you know the best way that i like to do it is if i'm really out of ideas is just to pick an interesting character trope or archetype from media that i'm interested in playing and and riff off that so you know oh i really want to play the you know i really enjoyed the new mandalorian show uh i'm gonna make a um uh, a character that's kind of like the mandalorian great um, obviously I'm going to look at different ways to make them interesting and cool. They're from some bounty hunter organization that has codes and credos and they always wear armor. I, you, you can, you can, <laughs> well, okay. Not that show vampire fine, but you can pick any show you want. Um, and, uh, Nohar is going to make a character that's just like baby Yoda. Okay. So this has gone totally off the rails, um, because no character can be that cute. All right. So anyway, um, yeah, always a good time. So, um, yeah, Down, Downton Abbey. Yeah, sure, you can do that. Um, annoying YouTubers. Yeah, see, there you go, right? I mean, it's it's all about picking something that inspires you and using that as the basis for your character. Um, and, I mean, yeah, there, there is some truth to that. If you're, if you're always building NPCs, you're basically just building PCs. You're just not playing them <laughs> all the time, which is nice. It offers a lot of flexibility. So, All right. So if anybody has any last-minute questions, we will, I will take those. Otherwise, uh, we are going to wrap this up here in just a moment. If you got one last question, I will take one more. One more question. And then we will call it good here on the Generating a PC Lecture. Player character. I don't know what an under butler is, Deacon Blues, but I, I can imagine it's awesome. How do I handle PCs that want to be chaotic evil? Or, you know, I'll expand that question to evil in general. Um, yeah, uh, there we go. Uh, so... Um, I, I think there's a really interesting question because this is mostly from the player side. So I want to, I want to stick to that. But if you are going to your GM and saying, Hey, I want to play an evil character, your next sentence needs to be, and this is why it's not going to ruin your campaign. Um, uh, chaotic almost carries the exact same requirement, to be honest. It's not quite as necessary, but it's close. Um, I think it is every player's responsibility to not play a character that's going to train wreck the campaign. That is not why you are being asked to sit at the table. Everyone is here to play this game together, and it is not all about you. So the piece of advice I would give you is if you're the GM having to deal with a player who said, hey, I want to play a chaotic evil character, the exact uh, thing you need to ask them is turning it around and looking them in the face and saying, what are you going to do to make this character a cohesive part of the group that doesn't betray everyone uh, and make the whole game come apart? They need to bring to the game uh, their, you know, reasonable uh, proposal for why this evil character wants to uh, uh, take part in the game. So, um, yeah, that's it. It, 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 it all comes down to the social contract and being evil is not impossible, but it does come with an extra burden of 
you really have to bring your game as to why you're willing to work with people who are not evil and why they should be willing to work with you. All right, everybody. I think that is going to wrap it up here for today. I want to thank you all for uh, watching in this video. If you're watching this on YouTube, this was recorded live on my Twitch channel, which you can find at twitch.tv backslash Jason Bullman. Um, I've been doing some videos like this uh, lately, um, mostly jam advice. It's the first one that I've done that's filled with player advice. If you like what you see here, make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, hit the little bell so you get notifications when I launch new videos. Uh, and feel free to watch the others as well. You know, leave some comments, leave some likes. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for watching, and we will see you next time.